Let's face it, Content Cop is officially over. It's hard to think of a creator as influential as iDubs. There are many other big names who have made their mark on the history of the internet, but Ian possessed unparalleled power in changing how public opinion would perceive any individual. This, of course, was because of Content Cop, a series that countless people held to the highest regard, seeing it as a death sentence for any channel that fell in Ian's crosshairs. The show was his claim to fame, and even after five years of being dormant, it remains the channel's most popular series. But looking back at it today with everything that's changed in the landscape, how does it hold up? Half a decade after its conclusion, did it age like milk? Or is it still one of the greatest web series of all time? Now that the hype has died down, it may be possible to see in a clearer light and answer the question of whether or not Content Cop was truly the channel killer everyone regarded it as. This is the Content Cop Retrospective. YouTube as a website was at the precipice of what many consider the glory days. Demonetization had yet to be conceptualized, and for the most part, media backlash against YouTube was non-existent, so the executives in control had yet to intervene during the rowdiest time on the platform. It was the age when you could post videos with almost no restrictions or fear of termination. For some, it was their favorite age of the internet. Content catering to edgy senses of humor was thriving, with channels like Filthy Frank, among others, but there was also a large group of people people who took advantage of the fact that they could post almost anything and create sleazy, over-the-top content for the sake of getting attention. So it was only natural that in an age where you could say anything, and there was an increasing amount of reprehensible creators gaining traction, that YouTube drama and commentary channels would rise in tandem. People such as Colossal is Crazy, H3H3, and Grade A Under A were just a handful of those who rose to stardom, discussing other creators in this manner. Eventually, joined by other pre-established figures who'd grown in other popular genres, genres like Keemstar and Boogie2988, it seems like at some point everyone was talking about misdeeds on YouTube. The wide range of people who joined this group gave it influence across the entire website, and ensured that when someone's actions were called out, the news of it spread to literally every corner of the internet. This was the perfect environment for a series like Content Cop to appear. In mid-2015, Ian was a relatively unknown creator, having just hit 100,000 subscribers on the iDubs TV channel. For the past five years, he'd produced gaming content, primarily consisting of indie game let's plays, as well as a face cam series called Gaming News Crap, where he'd discuss and sometimes mock events that could occur in the industry. Hey guys, welcome to my new show. I decided I want to start this new series so that I could express my creativity in new and interesting ways, and I figured if I start a new show, then it probably won't stay a new show, so... I could do other things too, I don't know. I, we're just gonna see where it takes us. The series later had a subsection called Kickstarter Crap, where he'd talk about bad gaming-related Kickstarter projects. And in 2013, these segments would become their own series by the same name. Hello everyone, and welcome back to more Kickstarter Crap, Kickstarter Crap, Kickstarter Crap. During its lifespan, Ian would stray further from the gaming theme and focus more on the absurdity of the subject matter. And at several points, the creators behind the projects he talked about would create response videos to him, which he responded back to. It was his informal introduction to the world of online drama, albeit on a smaller scale, and it wasn't long before Kickstarter crap and his responses to the project creators were the focus of his channel. Past the point of reaching 100,000 subscribers, he moved away from gaming entirely to focus on this new era of videos. It was also 
also around this time that Ian would become acquainted with other figures, such as Max Mofo, Filthy Frank, How to Basic, and anything for views. They had all come to know him from Max, who was an early iDub subscriber. Starting in November of 2015, the four would start creating what would become a long line of collaborative live-action videos, ranging from skits to dangerous games they'd make up. This is why cancer is not funny. People die, and it's not cool. That's why you can donate to cancer to the link in the description. And this grew his subscriber count by over 100,000 that month which was well above the 17,000 he gained in the previous 30 days. This growth accounted for over a third of his total following at the time. Possibly due to the influence of his friends, Ian would combine his commentary content with the group's signature skit comedy to create a brand new series the very next month, this time to focus on ridiculing bad creators. From day one, its premise was simple and memorable. Ian would criticize other creators either for the poor quality of their content or the integrity of their character, while donning a cop outfit and referring to himself as the content cop. This would also be accompanied with a memorable intro skit. Hey there folks, I'm the content cop. I'm here to make sure everyone's content is up to par, and if it's not, um, I'll bring them to justice. The first episode was relatively basic and centered on a channel known as Jinx Reload, the most subscribed creator in the infamous reaction video trend at the time. Your goal was to outdo everything the other reaction channels were doing? So you looked at the Fine Bros reaction channel and you said, yeah, I could do better than that. I'll show the video in its entirety rather than just showing clips of it. What's interesting about this video today is that Jinx himself isn't formally introduced in the video. The episode is made for those who already know who he is and are aware of the issues surrounding reaction channel content, which speaks volumes about the power of the commentary community at this time. Jinx was so infamous after having his name spread through discussion from people like I Hate Everything and Jax Films that by the time Ian joined the fray, the topic had already been deconstructed in full, and most everyone on the platform knew who Jinx was. But what made the Content Cop episode stand out from other videos made on him was the emphasis on roasting him for comedic value rather than just flatly talking about what he was doing wrong. Ian doesn't overtly say anything new, but his way of saying it keeps the video enjoyable and flowing at a snappy pace, since the runtime isn't bogged down by a big opening discussion about who Jinx is. Overall, the episode is still very informative, but it's clear it was made to focus on comedy above all else, especially since the video takes the time to mention specific things for the sake of humor rather than just as criticism. Ooh, feisty little thing. <laughs> ah, how long did it take you to come up with that, Jinx? Ooh, feisty little thing. You write that one down? Looking back, this video became recognizable because of its presentation and memorable lines, some of which would end up becoming memes. That month, Ian would also gain more than 120,000 subscribers, while today the video has over 19 million views. In response, Jinx released a now-deleted video that same day, asking others to approach him directly rather than making hate videos. Please don't make these videos these hate videos and all of that to stir up drama when you could just simply message me like, yo, can you take that down, bro? And then it can be cool. Like, all of that can be dead. It's, it's extra nonsense. It's bullshit. But with the timing, it was obvious who he was referring to. Jinx doesn't take any of the criticism into account and essentially brushes it off by saying if people don't want him to react to their content, they should reach out to him and say so since he can't tell who is fine with it or not. Of course, entirely ignoring the fact that his videos are copyright infringement and that he himself is the one required to reach out for permission, not the other way around. Jinx's content cop episode seemed to be the most impactful of any video made on him, since as a direct result of the backlash it created, Jinx quit reaction content entirely. Even still, it didn't seem to change his outlook at all. He didn't admit to having done anything wrong per se, so the move appears to have been done to quietly calm the hate, and Jinx would barely mention the incident in content going forward. However, on Twitter, he was livid. In the following month, he made several now-deleted tweets, stating he wanted to beat Ian up among other things, and Ian actually played along in the exchanges and offered to set up a box match, which Jinx agreed to. iDubs posted several videos building anticipation for the event and trained for the match, which Keemstar was organizing. Although, by March, Jinx pulled out from the event. Hey, what's going on, Celebrity Boxing? What's that? You say that Jinx pussied out of the fight? He's scared of me? He's scared of fighting me? Oh, oh, it's so... That's, I'm so sad to hear that, because I really wanted to fight him badly. Okay, I'll talk to you later. 
Well guys, it looks like the Jinx fight is officially off. He pussied out. Even after saying things like, uh, iDubbbz is a bitch boy on Twitter, he's the one who bitched out. It was largely because of these events that Content Cop grew its identity as an all-out war between Ian and his target. Prior to then, fights between YouTube creators on YouTube through video responses were hardly anything interesting. But Ian's presentation hyped up the idea to viewers, who began to see it as a battle of wits being fought out on the online landscape. Whether Ian knew it or not, this was the first step to building up Content Cop's reputation as a channel-ending force of nature. As for Jinx, his popularity would only degrade with time. He posted a variety of other content to try to continue his YouTube career, such as let's plays, vlogs, and comedy skits. But like most YouTubers who drastically changed their content, the majority of his audience didn't stick around, most likely because they were just there to watch the videos Jinx would gather up and put in the corner of the screen. In 2017, he realized his new content wasn't going to be successful and switched back to creating reaction videos. But by this point, it was too late. These uploads never received a fraction of their original view count and by that time, demonetization had started to hit his massive video backlog, which not only depleted his remaining revenue, but also earned him strike after strike that banned him from posting at points. As a result, he deleted over 150 million views worth of videos late that year. Jinx even abandoned his second channel, Jinx Reload, around the same time, which had been renamed to Sky Crew after his daughter. He made attempts to branch out once again and created another account to post music, but to no success. By 2020, Jinx made a video stating that YouTube had removed him from the algorithm and that he'd been living off his savings for the past few years, expecting to get his channel back in order. But after failing to do so with his kid to look after, he needed to quit reactions again for good. His channel after this point would largely consist of vlogs and streams, with continuously decreasing views and no sign of that ever changing. His fall from relevancy could be seen as a result of him quitting reactions, but maybe whether or not Content Cop existed, considering the fact that most of Jinx's viewers weren't there for him and instead the videos he watched, maybe he would have faded into irrelevancy one way or the other. The next topic Ian would tackle with his Content Cop series was a bit different. Rather than being centered on one creator, he chose to base the episode on the popular trend of food reviewers who eat fast food in their cars with very little entertainment value, like Joey's World Tour. On today's episode of Content Cop, we're going to be looking at food reviewers. Specifically, the food reviewers who review food from inside of their car. What's interesting about this is that it's clear Ian intended Content Cop episodes to be far more frequent when he first started making them. But as time passed, he upped the production quality and seems to be more aware of the weight each episode carried. His food reviewer episode was a small step in this direction. Unlike the first, this one features the cutaway skit segments throughout the video that would become a staple of the series, as well as the Content Cop intro song. As for the actual criticisms within, Ian focused less on the creators and more on the problems with the entire genre, making it feel much broader in scope. Let's peep this out. Just how Gouda is the latest from Wendy's? Let's peep this out. Arby's is kicking it up fajita style? Let's peep this out. No one's on the edge of their seat saying, oh, I can't wait to see Ian K's fast food review. It's like, no one gives a shit. So you gotta create suspense. If you don't have a crazy personality, if you don't have mad jokes, you gotta create suspense some other way. Are we serving breakfast all day? The lengths Ian was willing to go to for comedy really stood out and drew people into the episodes, even if the topic itself arguably was not the most interesting thing in the world. These jokes gave it a unique appeal and hammered in that Content Cop was not solely about roasting someone. There was also a blend of skit comedy reminiscent of Filthy Frank, and as time passed, Content Cop would embrace its identity and stand apart from other forms of drama video. As for the food reviewers, the impact from the Content Cop episode seemed to be minimal. No one mentioned was specifically focused on, so there didn't seem to be backlash towards any of them. Most of these creators continue to upload to this day, but have slowly grown stagnant, including Joey's World Tour. Hi everybody, it's Joey for Joey's World Tour! Ah! I'm back! As a whole, the food review trend has seen a large decline in the last few years, with only a handful of figures, like Review Bra, remaining relevant. But you could argue that it's gotten an indirect resurgence in the popularization of mukbang. Either way, the Content Cop episode made about the food review trend seemed to have very little effect on it. About two weeks after his prior episode, Ian released another Content Cop focused on toy channels, specifically the ones that feature kids opening and playing with the products. One example you may recognize is Ryan's Toy Reviews, an account run by the parents of a kid by the same name who appears as if he's being forced to read from a script. I do feel bad for a lot of the kids because in many cases they just follow the orders of the parents. They have some weird loose script that they go with and the mom says, 
say that you're excited, and then pull out the toy. You can tell in these series of clips that I'm about to show you that it goes from, hey, I'm excited to, I wanna fucking kill myself. Ian highlighted that for some reason, these channels have an odd fixation on giant surprise eggs, which are essentially containers of any shape that hold a variety of products based on the theme of the packaging. Today I have a giant Barbie egg. The episode itself is fairly similar to his food reviewer installments in that it focuses on the issues with a video genre rather than any specific creator. And for this reason, it didn't cause a lot of drama. The only response was from one of the featured creators who tried to take the video down using YouTube's copyright strike system. This stuff is great. It's a water-based formula. It's it's perfect if you want to get fucked by a toy channel. Today, however, the status of the video is fine, and the situation appears to have ended after the short dispute was over. Similar to the prior episode, this one was given several creative cutaway skits with the signature content cop theme at the start. It held the same standard of quality and was released soon enough after the last one to make it clear that Ian was still aiming to keep a consistent schedule. At this point, he'd found a format and was firmly sticking to it, which was paying off since he gained a staggering 140,000 subscribers that month alone. Large due to all three Content Cop episodes and another collaboration with the Filthy Frank crew. As for the Toy Channel trend, it would soon face obstacles much greater than Content Cop. Some forms of child-centered content would soon be made non-monetizable due to Google and YouTube facing backlash for tracking the data of underage users, forcing them to pay an $170 million settlement and impose several rules for content targeted at children. Today, most of the channels Ian featured in this video are still active in some form, but long past their prime and with almost no audience remaining. All except for one. Ryan's channel would go on to earn over 30 million subscribers and turn Ryan himself into a celebrity, even getting his own show on a recognizable television channel. Nickelodeon. His channel itself would face many of the same criticisms as Google itself for marketing to children, but today Ryan and his family seem to be largely unaffected by the controversy. The controversy with Rafi and Benny Fine trying to trademark the word react in order to seize control of the video format was one of the biggest YouTube controversies in 2016. The idea that they were seemingly forcing everyone on the website to produce reaction content exclusively through their React World brand was outrageous, and nearly every major figure expressed their disgust towards them during this time. I talked about this in the last video I did like this when H3 covered it, as you may remember. Gonna make this one quick. Ian did so as well in the Content Cop video focused on the two. Much like with the Jinx episode, its creation was made in direct response to controversy at the time, and at a point where most others had voiced their grievances already. By the time Ian had been able to release his video, the Fine Bros had made a final statement and retracted their trademark request for the term React, which he acknowledges at the end. Because of his timing, the episode didn't have much of an impact on the overall situation. It may have increased backlash against them, but by that point there was nothing more to gain. They continued their channel as they had, deviating very little, and have naturally declined in popularity with time. In hindsight, Site, this video as a whole was arguably the weakest content cop of the bunch. Being the second shortest, it was mostly void of the skit comedy the series had become known for, and most of the points made about the situation had already been discussed in a similar manner. Ian himself considers it to be his least favorite content cop, and as a result, he decided to change things up going forward by doubling down on making each episode as effortful as possible, and picking a target that had yet to be fully dissected in the public eye. In 2016, Keemstar was at what many would say was his absolute worst. Controversy after controversy had occurred on the Drama Alert channel, with very few taking notice at the time. He would face backlash for these events, like when he wrongfully called out a streamer as being a pedo, but after an apology, most seemed to move on. A similar cycle would repeat pretty often, where a controversy would happen, it would be addressed in some way, and people would quiet down. While for the time being, everyone had forgotten, there was a big backlog of criticisms to be made about Keemstar, and one of the first big creators to speak up about Keemstar was Ian himself on May 5th, 2016, when he released Content Cop Keemstar. It had been three months since the last episode, and in that time, he put together his longest video yet. It featured Ian systematically deconstructing most every flaw with Drama Alert and Keemstar himself, and several long live-action segments of him destroying a gnome that he'd painted set to an all-star parody song at the end. Hey now, you're a Keemstar, do a trick shot, MLG. Hey now, you're a Keemstar, eat your popcorn, go tea, and all I report is the news, if you can call this news. 
is. From the moment it dropped, this video took the internet by storm. It voiced the grievances many others in the YouTube community had about Keemstar, and soon turned public opinion completely against him. And that was when he was at his most obnoxious. Like, yeah. he was sitting on the Death Star, and he thought he was like fucking <laughs> was just Palpatine. Pure evil. Just dropping laser bombs, calling everyone pedophiles. He was like fucking <laughs> Reign of Terror. Yeah. And you, I mean, and it was like at the perfect timing, you dropped this 20 minute just <laughs> roast yeah. of this gnome popcorn eating fuck. However, what most people are not aware of is that the Keemstar situation only saw widespread traction and gained its reputation because of Leafy and Grade A Underre, who made their own videos on Keemstar a month later and really created the bandwagon of Keemstar hate. The two were later called out for doing so with selfish motives, but regardless, their actions drew more publicity to the Content Cop episode and built a certain status around the iDub's name. What happened is months later, um, two people betrayed me. Leafy is here, mm -hmm. grade A under A. So as these exposed videos are building up, the iDub's video was real it didn't it didn't take me out of context it didn't say oh look at him saying these horrible things you know like it didn't that one was fine it was leafy and grade a under a who took a bunch of shit completely out of yeah. context didn't tell the story didn't do the backstory they wanted to backstab me because we were actually friends we would talk like every single night on yeah. skype the series grew increasingly known for its powerful roasts that could tear down a channel unlike his prior video subjects like jinx and the fine bros who had been infamous already keemstar wasn't nearly as much of a polarizing figure beforehand the community response to the content cop episode turned things around completely despite ian being a much smaller figure in comparison who was facing an up Hill battle. Despite the risk associated, things ultimately paid off, and the video was adored by millions. I wanted to be smart about it, mm -hmm. and I, you know, it was very much like the Keemstar thing. It's like a lot of people didn't realize because everyone decided to jump on the bandwagon after the fact. Mm -hmm. But like leading up to it, I was very nervous because yeah, obviously, mm -hmm. like it, it was a big deal. He he had many more subscribers than me. Many people told me yeah. like this is a bad idea. He, Shit tons <laughs> of people said, I don't know if you should do that. <laughs> it must have been scary. And no one had really taken like major shots at him since then. Yeah, it, it's the the whole thing was really bizarre. I was I was afraid like at that point, like Keem's uh, avid supporters would, you know, mm -hmm. you know, dox me or do whatever, mm -hmm. this or that. With Ian gaining nearly 500,000 subscribers in the following two months, with the indirect aid of Leafy and Grade A Under A, while Keemstar himself became one of the most hated people online. But even from day one, he didn't seem too upset about the video. So I finally watched the iDubs video from beginning all the way to end. And so many of you keep asking me for an official response. Now at first I thought he was misleading with the DMs because someone sent me that part, but he actually wasn't. He showed that I said laughing out loud. I find it almost impossible to fight with people who I think are funny. iDubs knows I've been watching his videos forever. He knows I'm a fan of him. And he's fucking rolling on the ground with popcorn and fucking gnomes and shit. And I'm just not mad. It's funny. Like I... I like that dude's videos. Over the following years, Keemstar had a plethora of controversy, such as his feud with Ethan of H3. But through all of it, he's remained popular and managed to sustain himself on the platform. Although as of late, he's announced his plans to step down as the host of Drama Alert once a permanent replacement host can be found. Keemstar may not be the most hated name on the internet anymore, but he remains a polarizing figure, which is still an influence of Ian's Content Cop episode. It even started the joke of comparing him to a gnome, which is still popular today. Looking back, this was truly the turning point when Content Cop went from just another commentary series to a true internet legend. It's clear that after making the Fine Bros video, Ian grew dissatisfied with the direction of the series, and decided to go in a complete opposite way by putting more effort into the skit portion of his videos, increasing episode runtimes, decreasing the frequency he put them up at, and focusing on discussing people who deserved backlash but weren't already in the spotlight. It seems like Ian realized this is what he wanted Content Cop to be. But before I go any further, the Content Cop Retrospective is brought to you by the Turkey Tom plush. Thanks to Makeship, there is now the first ever piece of Turkey Tom merchandise, and it's available for a limited time only. I admit it's pretty cool to have this stupid character for my channel translated into something I can actually touch and throw at the walls and shit. If you like my videos, then this is a great way to support the channel, and I really appreciate everyone who has already made an order. As of this video's release, it has about a week left to be purchased, and then it's not coming back, so grab it now if you want it. I'll link it in the description, as well as in the top comment. Okay, now back to your regularly scheduled programming.
The sixth installment of the series was largely a return to norms. There was still a lot of effort put into the cutaway gags, but in general the episode was shorter and focused more on expanding this previous topic of toy channels. This could have been Ian's way of adding depth to an episode he'd been unsatisfied prior, or to get back at the toy channel who'd striked him before. Either way, the video itself is fairly average in comparison to the rest of the catalog. It focused primarily on the offshoot of toy channels who participated in the infamous Spider-Man and Elsa trend that was at its peak that year. It's just disappointing to type Spider-Man in the search bar and have shit like this show up. I wanted to watch the Spider-Man theatrical trailer. I didn't want to watch this cancer. If you haven't come across any of these superhero videos on YouTube, consider yourself lucky because they all play the same way. It's a silent film featuring grossly out of shape superhero and a pregnant Elsa. Ian does go over things in the video, like the giant gummy bottle trend, but the majority centers on what would become known as the Elsa Gate controversy. This strange video genre would become so popular that it raised public concern for what videos were allowed to be considered child friendly by YouTube, and for the website to make policy changes to get rid of the genre, and even outright delete some of its biggest accounts. For this reason, it should be no surprise that the channels mentioned by Ian in this Content Cop episode have mostly been killed off by the algorithm. Webs and Tiara Toy Monster Compilations was the biggest channel shown in the video, and was one of the accounts terminated by the website for the disturbing content. The others he mentioned are either inactive or have strayed away from this style of content. The strangest example is Toys and Me, which at the time of the Content Cop episode featured a little girl playing with toys, but in the time since she grew up and took over the channel, she changed its name to Tiana and began posting Roblox and vlog content, which appears to have been very successful in its own right. In 2016, prank channels on YouTube were reaching new lows. Content often pushed the boundaries of being public harassment and softcore porn, or went the route of being cruel and traumatizing for shock value. But most were completely fake no matter what approach they took. The scene was ripe for criticism from the commentary community. Many people, like H3, took shots at the most infamous prank channels, like Sam Pepper, Soflo Antonio, Prank Invasion, and Joey Salads. But possibly to get his word in without covering the same ground, Ian decided to create a video on a creator within this genre who tended to be overshadowed by his more infamous peers. That person was Dennis Rohde of the How to Prank It Up channel. Dennis's content started off as similar to a lot of other prank YouTubers, but he'd made the switch to instead teaching viewers how to prank others rather than performing the pranks himself. This gave Ian room to give different kinds of critiques on the genre than many others who had talked about the integrity of the creators. Instead, he showcased the laughably mundane and dysfunctional pranks Dennis would try to teach in his videos. The How to Prank It Up content cop was less of a roast of Dennis himself, and instead simply criticized his content for how bad the pranks themselves were. He pointed out how many of them were needlessly difficult, wouldn't work, or didn't have a good payoff. Yeah, that, that is so unlike a normal freeze pop. I don't eat those things and have a blue tongue afterward ever. So when you had a blue tongue, I was like, Whoa! In terms of Ian's videos made on a specific creator, this one is undoubtedly the nicest. It seems that it was mostly created to discuss the prank channel trend itself and use Dennis as an example, since his content embodied a lot of the issues of the genre that tended to go unaddressed by others. The video is also filled with cutaway segments of Ian performing spoof pranks that add a lot of humor, so the emphasis is mostly on jokes rather than roasting him. This prank I'm about to show you is inspired by some of the previous pranks you just watched. This prank is called, it doesn't matter how bad this prank is, this video is for morons prank. What happened? Where the heck did this stuff come from? For this reason, Dennis himself stated in two different comments that he liked the content cop, making him the only creator other than Keemstar to respond this way. Despite this, however, he didn't seem to take Ian's criticism since his content changed very little in the years following. Over time, it did take a dip in views, but this was most likely because of the initial wave of demonetization on pranks in 2016, rather than Ian's content cop. This was primarily due to a new guideline made specifically to combat dangerous pranks. Even still, Dennis continued to post. Most of his videos continued to focus on pranks, but as of nearly a year ago, he's disappeared from the internet, abandoning all of his channels and most social media without any word as to why. But by this time, his channel had decayed to such a degree that it was inevitable he would leave. His last known activity was on Instagram in December of 2021, with another prank video. So it's clear that whether he intends to continue the YouTube channel or not, he's remained passionate about the genre of content. Believe me, if I could make one single video without mentioning this guy, I would, but it's simply unavoidable with the topic. I can kill myself, just let me speak. Holy shit. Hey guys,
Of all of the videos released by Ian in the Content Cop series, there was none quite like the Leafy episode. Much like the Keemstar installment, it was packed with funny cutaway skits and had a lot of effort put in. But this one was far more personal. From beginning to end, it was one of the most effective roasts ever put up on YouTube. Because today is the day we get to bully Leafy! At the time, Leafy was almost universally liked, despite many considering his content to be akin to bullying. Other figures like H3H3 had criticized him for this prior, but Leafy had remained in good standing with the community. However, Ian opted to not simply critique him. Content Cop Leafy was created to beat him at his own game and show the world that he had his own insecurities, much like those he mocked. I want to bring your attention to this picture. This is a picture of Leafy at uh, the little meetup, and there's no filter here. This is him in his natural environment. Unfortunately, a profile shot. If you look at anyone with a weak chin, their enemy is the profile shot. It ruins them. I, I love that too, by the way, calling them face cam videos. You know, for the, the rest of the planet who isn't afraid to show their face, we just call them videos. Rather than Ian's serious talking points, the chin joke would prove to be Leafy's Achilles heel, or in this case, Achilles chin. He posted a response video shortly after the content cop and spent such a long time addressing it that it confirms to most viewers that he was, in fact, sensitive about his rather weak jaw. By the way, Leafy, why did you ban me from commenting on your video? I was just gonna say something supportive like, it doesn't matter if you don't have a chin, Leafy. We still love you. But then I tried to use my alternate account to see if I can post anything. And I can, but I can't use words like chin or idubs in the comment. Chim, chimini, chim, chimini, chim, chim, chiri. A sweep is as lucky as lucky can be. In Leafy's efforts to roast Ian back, he unintentionally defeated his own arguments by making fun of videos like Slenderman Gangnam Style, which Ian himself jokes about, and saying that he has a high hairline, which Ian played into in his follow-up video. Ironically, if Leafy had done the same thing when criticized, there would be very little Ian could say back. Instead, Leafy walked right into his trap and ultimately showed his own insecurity at the time. Roast comparing me to this dude, this motherfucker, or pretty much anyone in anime. I look like a goddamn anime character. What the fuck? You're all of a sudden wanting to pretend like you didn't watch the video. I definitely compared you to some cartoon characters, dude. But they weren't attractive ones. They were very ugly ones without chins. That's probably why you're not mentioning those ones. You've sort of selectively removed that from your head. After Ian made his rebuttal in the sequel video, Content Deputy Leafy, Leafy himself went silent on the matter, but his initial response doomed him in the public eye. He tried to tear into Ian as he did with those he normally discussed, which only proved the points made against him. And this is exactly what Ian wanted. The content cop made against Leafy was mainly made to provoke him and prove he couldn't handle the treatment he gave others. Had Leafy laughed it all out, or even ignored it, the backlash could have faded because the video was a joke above all else. Episodes like the Keemstar content cop were made to showcase the flaws of its subjects in depth to the audience, so any realistic response wouldn't matter. But this was a different story. Everyone knew about the complaints levied at Leafy for being a cyberbully or making lazy videos, but by making him look just as sensitive as those he talked about, to many, it completely destroyed his credibility. The most ironic thing about this situation is that you could argue Ian himself is as guilty of cyberbullying as Leafy is, and that the two shared a fan base at the time. They were both similar figures in the community, and it was largely because of Leafy that Content Cop even got his reputation due to him fueling the drama with Keemstar. Had Ian tried to call out Leafy in the way many others had, he could have been labeled a hypocrite and turned his own audience against him. But in the way that he handled things, it ended up being Leafy who fell into this trap. From that point on, public opinion soured almost overnight far quicker than the content cop on Keemstar and without any outside support. Many argue that when Leafy quit and left YouTube abruptly in mid-2017, it was due to the ripple effect of the content cop episode, although I'd argue this was not the case at all. Leafy had continued on well after the video, but his decline in raw views had started a couple of months before the content cop. Around that point, demonetization had taken effect, which eventually made his channel much less profitable than it was prior. The content cop didn't end his channel, but it did end his reputation. Once the money stopped rolling in, he had no respect or goodwill from the community to stick around for, so he didn't. When Leafy eventually returned in 2020, he would occasionally make fun of Ian, but his new wave of videos was cut short when YouTube abruptly suspended his account for bullying and harassment. The year prior, the Content Cop episode on Leafy was deleted by YouTube themselves as well, which speaks volumes about how the website has changed in the time since. I, I have went so far to trying to figure out why Leafy got banned and can he get unbanned? Like, you don't understand. I'm talking like hours and hours and talking to a lot of people, some people that work at YouTube. And basically what came back through the grapevine was Leafy did something horrible and we can't really say what it is, 
Uh -oh. has nothing to do with Pokemon. Shortly after his ban from YouTube, things went mostly silent for Leafy. He did try maintaining his Twitch account, but was banned from that as well. And every new YouTube account he's created in efforts to return to his home platform have also been smited, such as Weefy, Lucky, and LeafyCast. Today, he remains online with his Instagram, Storyfire, and original Twitter that he managed to get back from hackers after five years. But no real content has come out since then because he has nowhere to post it. When it comes to dead channels, Leafy's is the only one discussed by Content Cop that is literally dead. But Content Cop did not directly kill it. Even still, this was yet another win for Ian, and his channel saw record levels of growth the month of the video's release, with nearly 620,000 new subscribers. This event sealed Content Cop's reputation as one of the most deadly series on YouTube, and from that point on, everyone was eagerly anticipating Ian's next episode. The Content Cop immediately following Leafy's was on the trend of channels who break devices like computers, laptops, and most commonly iPhones. In many ways, it was more akin to the older episodes that were shorter and focused on groups rather than specific creators, but with more of the live-action cutaways people had come to associate with the series. The video mainly focuses on how tech destruction channels reel in their viewers with excess and shock value by breaking valuable things in an over-the-top way, but that they tend to be uncreative and devoid of any personality. There are a lot of YouTube videos that get a shit ton of views because they go the route of excess. They'll use a shit ton of Orbeez in a pool. They'll fill a pool with Coke in the case of tech racks uh, or slime or dry ice or whatever. The reason I bring this up is because it speaks to the mindset that a lot of these channels have. They know that if you empty 1,500 gallons of pig's blood into a pool, that's enough to get views. A fair portion of the runtime is dedicated to Ian coming up with more unique ways to do this type of video. And in the end segment, he's nearly arrested for dropping objects off of a public building. When it went up, this episode was regarded well, but didn't have any noteworthy impact on the landscape itself. Today, the tech destruction channels Ian shows in the video are still very successful, outside of two, who seemingly went inactive for no reason. And it appears that the trend has actually only grown in the time since, being bigger than it ever has. A YouTuber known as Tana Mojo was made aware of the iDubs channel through a friend who showed her one of his videos. In it, Ian used the forbidden N-word, and this made Tana upset since she believed doing so while you're white is wrong. So she went to Twitter and impulsively tweeted at Ian to off himself, as well as went on to go after him in a further stream. Tana deleted these shortly after, but unbeknownst to her, the situation put her on Ian's radar. After looking into Tana's channel at the time, she was a storytime YouTuber whose content tended to exaggerate the truth quite often. But what stuck out the most to Ian is that she herself had used the N-word in older videos. Meanwhile, her explanations as to why it didn't make sense since she said it with a hard R in a very derogatory manner. You know you're a stupid you fucking Growing up in Vegas, everybody said those words and I didn't even know that they were considered racist at all. They were in rap songs and I totally thought it just meant like homie or like friend. Having learned this, Ian decided to go to an event she was hosting at the time and say the N-word in front of her to see what would happen. <laughs> The end result was Ian getting kicked out from the event, and Tana comically exaggerating the details of what happened to paint Ian as violent before the footage surfaced. He walks up to me, and he kind of like locks his arm around me, like around my neck like this, and it, it wasn't like it was like a chokehold or anything, it was it was very like firm and like tight, like I couldn't have really gotten it out, if that makes sense, I, I'll explain that in a second. And so the guy looks at me, and he wraps his arm around me, and he looks in the camera, and he goes, say, and puts his thumbs up, and then like blank, and he says the N-word, like hard R. One week before the exchange change was even shown in the Content Cop episode, Tana posted a video called The N-Word, reinforcing her stance and describing the situation once again. People were already skeptical of Tana's statements, but when the Content Cop episode did drop, it confirmed what many people already suspected. Aside from Ian's appearance at Tana's event, the rest of the video was fairly void of cutaway segments due to the time crunch that came from Tana speaking about it early, and mainly is an ideological discussion about the use of the N-word itself. Ian's stance was that using it in a defensive context is fine, and that doing so takes away the power it has to be used negatively, while Tana said that doing so is racist when you're white regardless of context. I'm a white person and I think it's okay to say that word. It doesn't matter the context that you say it in, it's still racist. It doesn't matter the context you say it in, it's still racist. Listen up, teachers of America. If you've ever read aloud Huckleberry Finn to your students, 
You've engaged in an act of racism. These days, far more people side with Tana's stance than in 2017. But ironically, her previous video saying the N-word would still be considered racist by either side's viewpoints, which made it hypocritical for her to criticize him at all. When the episode premiered, it made quite a splash, and Tana lost around 100,000 subscribers over 2 million. But this effect was made worse by a YouTube glitch going on at the time, where unsubscribing would remove two subscriptions as far as the subscriber counter, which not only doubled the amount the website claimed she lost, Lost, but led to thousands of people exploiting the glitch to lower the number even further. Although, once the glitch was patched, things returned to normal. Afterwards, Tana made an apology that was mass disliked, but did address most of the points made in the Content Cop episode. She acknowledged that she felt wrong for saying the N-word as she had without apologizing, and that her prior apologies were inadequate, as well as owned the fact that calling someone else out for saying it was hypocritical. She also states that her treatment of Ian on Twitter and in streams was wrong, as was painting him to look bad at the event without waiting for the footage to surface in order to double check that she remembered it correctly. How she didn't remember an event that had just happened is beyond me, but I won't harp on it too much. She stood by her stance that saying the n-word is wrong in any context, but opted out of trying to debate Ian on it any further. After this, the situation came to a close, and unlike with Leafy, Ian never made a follow-up to address Tana's reply. The backlash against her was consistent for quite some time, but eventually died out, although this was far from the only controversy she would run into. A few months later, in June of that same year, she was denied a featured creator spot at VidCon 2017, and in response, created her own convention to be held at the same time the following year known as TanaCon. As you probably know, the event was a complete failure and became an infamous story. It was riddled with flaws, mostly coming down to poor planning. This led to thousands of people lining up and overcrowding the area. This resulted in some passing out from heat stroke, as well as a lot of overcrowding. She would later give more of her side to the story in a video series in collaboration with Shane Dawson, which partially repaired her reputation. However, in the time since then, she's gotten into many new problems for her personal life, but her relationship with Jake Paul made the biggest splash. The two were set to be publicly married, and the event was streamed on a pay-per-view service for $50. With it being discovered afterwards that the wedding wasn't legally binding due to them not getting a marriage license in their state, whether they were ever a legitimate couple or not, the two ended their relationship in early 2020. This would be one of the many complicated romances in her life, with another being a three-way relationship with Bella Thorne and a singer named Ma son. Today, Tana continues to create videos in relatively the same style as she had before, but has built a lot of connections in the Hollywood sphere and branched out quite a bit. She started releasing music in 2017, and in July of 2021 created a podcast called Cancelled that continues to this day. In an interview when looking back at the iDubbbz drama, she said that she deserved to be called out for her hypocrisy in the Content Cop episode. But I deserved it 100%, and the Content Cop was good I and I feel like right, you've, you've, like, swallowed up this, like, self-guilt. At the end of the day, you were calling out a white dude who's saying the n-word that's pretty common right but where did i have the room to call him out you know yeah i, I mean you definitely didn't really have like a reason to but exactly. it still seems like, like a fairly like entitled. legitimate concern it, for someone maybe who didn't have like dirty hands like me you know what right I mean? yeah Kind yeah. of hypocritical, that's true. Super yeah. hypocritical. And as a final note on this episode, it is truly a testament to how much impact and weight Ian's presence had as a result of the Content Cop series. It's likely the Content Cop on Tana we saw is radically different from what Ian had originally planned, because as he subtly acknowledges in the video, many others had beaten him to it. What else can be said about this topic that hasn't been said already? Not much. Pretty much everyone said it already. As soon as word of the existence of a video of Ian at Tana's event came out, channel after channel on YouTube posted videos criticizing her and basically summarizing some of the main criticisms Ian would have made before he was even able to get to the editing stage. Funnily enough, I left a comment about this on the Tana episode five years ago when it first came out, and it's a sentiment that stuck with me. The Content Cop series was no longer simply that, a series of videos. It was now a phenomenon that everyone intended to profit from themselves. In 2017, vlogging content had gotten quite popular and there were several figures who'd risen to the top of YouTube. Among them were infamous individuals who had a tendency to flex their wealth and come off as unlikable and arrogant. Two of these names who likely come to mind as the biggest punching bags on YouTube at the time were Jake and Logan Paul, two brothers who had been Disney Channel stars and gained an internet following on Vine before moving to YouTube. Everyone was talking about them at the time with Jake being considered the worst of the two, since this was well before the Japanese forest controversy. So initially, after Ian returned from his eight-month hiatus from the series and dropped content cop Jake Paul completely out of the blue, many viewers were not surprised who he chose to talk about. At least, not until they watched the video. You're going to be sorely disappointed because this video is not about this obnoxious, arrogant asshole. It's about an entirely different obnoxious, arrogant asshole. 
To the surprise of many, the Content Cop episode was actually about Rice Gum, who had even asked for one to be made on him prior. At the time, he was a very controversial figure, both because of his boastful nature and past mistakes, including an insensitive talk with a rape victim, using a ghostwriter for his songs, keeping $10,000 that was to be given to a winner of a challenge he conducted, recording people without their consent, and a long history of bad interactions with other YouTubers. In the brief period he's been on YouTube, he's managed to commit all seven of the deadly YouTuber sins. So that's the theme for today's video. Seven deadly sins. The video was most comparable to the Keemstar Content Cop, in that it's a comedic deconstruction of all of Ricegum's past mistakes with cutaway segments. But this episode is a major step up. Not only does it rival the Leafy episode in terms of roast, but it's the longest episode of the series, and the skits in the middle have production quality much higher than anything he'd created before. Given that Ricegum is known for his diss tracks on other YouTubers, the video even ends with an original song created with the help of the popular musician Boy in a Band, and features cameos from him, as well as Ethan from H3H3, and even PewDiePie. Wait, you're stupid to explain your views because it was basic? Because I won block Rubik's Cube? This episode of Content Cop was regarded as one of the best of the series. It didn't necessarily change public perception like his episode on Keemstar or Leafy, but it topped all his previous efforts in terms of comedy and production. As for Ricegum himself, he made a 20-minute response which ended with his own diss track known as Frick to Police. Both it and the response itself were widely hated, and before long, Ian responded with a Content Deputy episode. So he made sure to put this at the start of the video so everyone sees it, right? Of course I did. Why wouldn't I? You're, you're acting as if this is some Logan Paul feud. I'm not here to be friends with you, okay? I'm here to explain why you're worthy of criticism. But out of everyone, I don't, should not be the one calling me out for it. <laughs> Rape is good. Like, I know I fucked up, but like, I don't really out of everyone to call me out. This guy calls me out. Well, you have some pretty horrible comprehension because I was hardly calling you out for it. I used it as a point to illustrate that you can be criticized for it. I didn't say that I'm morally superior to you. After that, very little else happened and the controversy settled altogether. Although, on March 15th, 2018, Bryce Gum came on Drama Alert and revealed that he'd asked Ian for a boxing match after seeing KSI and Logan Paul organize their own. He reached out to Max Mofo and others but was told Ian wouldn't do it, and he never directly responded. And it's like, I don't even think it's like he scared me because like I'm really not intimidating with the, you know, I'm skinny or whatever. I just think... I mean, I don't know why he doesn't want to box me because the whole Jinx thing, you know, Jinx, he didn't want to box Idubs. And I just remember on Twitter, you know, Idubs like was always tweeting at him, oh, fight me, this, this, right. fight me. Yeah, and it's just weird that now the opportunity comes for someone to fight, he just. He doesn't want to fight me, so. Even after the Drama Alert interview came out, little more seemed to come of this. Rice Gum would get into more controversy when on June 12th that same year, he went to Hong Kong, China, and made a vlog titled, Why I Left the Clout House, I'm Sorry, where he went around the streets yelling at random people. This video was then translated and re-uploaded by a Chinese news outlet where Rice Gum was ridiculed by many. Two weeks later, he responded and defended himself, but in a fair portion of the video, he expressed outrage that the translated version of the video had gotten more views than his own. I was on the site and right here it says 780 Ching Ching Chong. You know, I don't know what it's saying. You translated? Boy, you're telling me some guy took my hard work and content and just reposted it and got more views than my actual video, yo. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? When the news broke, he was called out by many, including Philly D, and he would get into hot water once again on December 31st, 2018, when he posted a video called How I Got AirPods for $4, promoting an illegitimate gambling site called Mystery Brand, and was called out for encouraging gambling to his child audience by H3H3 and PewDiePie, alongside others who'd taken the sponsorship like Jake Paul. Ricegum responded and defended himself during the situation, and in the same video promoted Amazon gift card codes that were revealed to already be expired. From this point on, very little else drew the public eye in his direction, and as he faded from the spotlight, his channel would begin to stagnate in subscribers, but retain decent views. However, he stopped posting entirely on June 12, 2020. Ricegum would unofficially move to Twitch for the next year before abandoning both it and his Twitter. He'd posted twice to his Instagram in the time since, but appears to be inactive elsewhere. By, by, by the way he uploads, bro, he uploads like, one, like once a month, he does not like YouTube, bro. Like, he's on the same wave as all of us, bro. Like, no one likes doing YouTube, bro. Like, and like, I, like, I'm not a slave to it, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I'm not trapped to it where like, oh, I need money, I gotta continue to post, like, 
nah, bro, I just, the YouTube shit changed, and, like, I'm just not, I'm not following along, bro, I'm just not posting, but, yeah, no, bro, all these guys don't like YouTube, I mean, like, if he loves it so much, why is he posting the once a month, like, you know what I mean, like, all these YouTubers just slowly stop posting, because they slowly don't fuck with it, like, it's, it's real shit, bro, I'm being serious. One month prior to his disappearance, he'd messaged Ian's wife, asking Ian to fight him in a boxing match once again, to which Ian actually responded and took him up on the offer. Although, midway into them organizing the event, Ricegum went silent, eventually leading Ian to make his You're Hiding From Me video in October of 2021. Keemstar reached out to Ricegum for a response, and he stated he's retired from YouTube and that Ian is irrelevant and using him for views. He said that after not responding to his offer to fight in 2018, Ian missed his chance to do so. Given that Ricegum was the one who reached out and offered again years later, it was clear to most that he was just trying to think of an excuse to get out of the match. As of March 25th, Ian posted an update video revealing that he'd found a new opponent, so it's clear that there will never be another Ricegum boxing match, and that this could mark the end of Ricegum's time in the limelight. It's been five years since the last episode of Content Cop, and Ian has been silent as to why. After the Rice Gum installment, many people thought the gaps between episodes were simply getting longer, and that eventually Ian would return with yet another episode that would top all the others. But this didn't happen. Many have theorized exactly why this is, but it could be due to a variety of factors. By this point in time, the demonetization system had been put in, and his brand of content was made unprofitable almost instantly. The deletion of his Leafy episode highlights just how risky posting new episodes has has become. The last episode of Content Cop was also similarly timed to his friend Joji leaving the Filthy Frank channel, which faced the same issue. In the years following, several Filthy Frank episodes have been deleted entirely by YouTube, with the website making it clear that that kind of content is simply not allowed anymore. Not to mention that by this point, the series had gotten such a powerful reputation that it put Ian in an uncomfortable position, because essentially after becoming such a large creator with nearly 6 million subscribers by the end, it made it difficult to pick targets without punching down or running the risk of going after someone that could eventually turn the public against him. The first time Ian faced backlash of his own was in March of 2020, when people made jokes about him being a simp after news spread that his girlfriend had an OnlyFans account. Ian posted a response to this that was widely criticized, and even Leafy spoke up to make jokes about him during this event. Ironically, since the entire situation was a joke, Ian would have looked far better in the end if he had never responded. Very similar to Leafy with his Content Cop episode. If there's any theme to come from this, it would be that everyone has something that bothers them. And even Ian, with the reputation his series has gotten, is no exception. Maybe the reason he stopped is because he knew it was only a matter of time before the series got him into a battle he simply couldn't win. But was Content Cop truly the channel-ending force of nature many regarded it as during its prime? No. Half of the series didn't even focus on specific creators, and most of the channels featured in the others faded much later on for completely disconnected reasons. But what Content Cop did excel at was changing public opinion in an instant. The videos were very well made, and the effort put in by Ian allowed them to be spread and gain a strong following. With the amount of influence he acquired and the intelligent way he presented his arguments, Content Cop had the ability to turn someone's reputation around in an instant, or, at the very least, illuminate a new, vicious, very large group of people to the fact that there was a creator committing various misdeeds. But in the end, maybe this could also be why he canceled the series. Despite how his fanbase regarded it, Ian had stated multiple times he wasn't trying to ruin people's careers or cause change, and was simply trying to focus on comedy. But Kimstar has changed so much since then. Well, that's my point too, why your videos are so great is because it has an impact. Yeah. I swear to you that that Kimstar one and the Leafy one has such an impact. I mean, you fucked. You, f you, you destroyed them. I feel like you ushered us into the new age of, like, the new age of peace, dog. You're Luke Skywalker. You fucking took down the, the, uh, re Republic, dog. Goddamn. You think? Jesus is here. <laughs> yeah, no, but for real, right, Hila? <laughs> no, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, and, but at the same time, you're also just, like, in it for the memes. Yeah. Which makes it even better. You're uh, not yeah. there to, like... I just, it, it was really fun to do that gnome stuff, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I spent so much time in my room painting up that gnome. Yeah. Because it obviously didn't look like, look that way at the start. Okay, I spent a whole I night I didn't know painting that. up this gnome. That's And funny. I was like so, I had such a good time. I took so many pictures of this gnome after it had the G Fuel logo on it. Wonderful. And I was like, this will be the best video ever after just doing that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah.
Maybe if Content Cop and Ian had not grown as big as they did, the series would still be going to this day. Something which makes even more sense when you consider he also stopped creating episodes of Kickstarter crap around the same point which would have a similar problem. But at the same time, it's hard to think about what would have happened if Content Cop hadn't gained the influence it did. Maybe we'd have more episodes, but they likely would be shorter and frankly, less funny. The show never would have reached its creative peak. I guess at the end of the day, we should be thankful for the episodes we got and recognize that for one reason or the other, the series was always going to have an ending. It was a good show. I'm not bashing the show. It was a good show. But I, the, the difference is, I will let a show come to an end because every good story needs to have a fucking ending. That's the reason why so many of these goddamn shows turn out to be just the fucking worst. Is they're like, well, we still want to earn a paycheck, so let's keep this gravy train rolling. No, fucking end it a sap, and uh, you can move on to the next project. I've been Turkey Tom. Thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone.